Okay, so we're talking house of pies before midnight. Because, you know, you got to show up before midnight, otherwise my pumpkin turns into a 1969 Corvette and I hit the 101. Joe, listen, I got to ask you something. Just to get this straight, just so it's a matter of public record, you're crawling back to me, right? You're not crawling. He wants everybody to know he's not crawling. Okay, so how do you want to spin it, Joe? Ah, okay. I approve, I guess. See ya. He's not crawling back to me. He just rethought things. So he's, he's taken up thinking now. <laughs> hmm. And I told him I approve. But we don't want to talk about Joe. We're not going to talk about men. Not that much this time. We're going to talk about women. I'm going to talk about people's idea of how women appear in film noir, which is not entirely always right. People think uh, all the women in film noir are stereotypes, but that idea in itself is a stereotype. It's not necessarily always true. For instance, um, there's uh, the movie called Raw Deal, directed by Anthony Mann. This principal character in that movie, played by Claire Trevor, she narrates the whole movie. It's from her point of view. And her situation is that she helps the man she loves breaks out of prison. He breaks out of prison. She's his getaway car, right? And she's his outside person who helps him do it. And after sacrificing everything for this man, putting herself in danger, she finds out when he's finally out, that he's in love with his lawyer, who's a woman who had all the opportunities she never had. Got to go to great schools, got to, to be raised up in a wealthy family, and had the opportunity to be a lawyer back in the day when there were not that many uh, women lawyers. So she has to observe the man that she loves and help get out of prison being in love with this lawyer. And then there are little intricacies and twists along the way. But at the end, there's an interesting kind of silent, unspoken reconciliation between these two women. And it is also notable that she tells the story her way. And it is film noir. So that's one example when, it, uh, when a woman has a strong voice. And then... We're going to talk about Gloria Graham. Gloria Graham. Everybody's going to want to talk about Gloria Graham and want to go see her movie, too. I mean, it's not her movie. It's the movie where Annette Benning plays her. Film stars don't die in Liverpool. And it is based on the tail end of Gloria Graham's pretty, well, I would say, sporadically scandalous life. Scandalous even by contemporary standards. It was her either second or third husband, I forget which, it's probably on Wikipedia if you want to look it up. Her husband found her in bed with his young son who had just come back from military school. Well, that totally messed up that particular marriage. But then they got back together quite a few years later. I think he was 22 now, and they married, and they had children. I don't mean her husband and she got back together. I don't mean that. I mean she got back together with the son of her husband. So that makes me think, well, I'm shocked, first of all. Totally shocked, but interesting life. So Gloria Graham, for our purposes here today, we're going to talk about threatened women the theme of threatened women. So she plays a gangster's mall in The Big Heat. The Big Heat, which was directed by Fritz Lang. And if you're familiar with Fritz Lang and know maybe his most famous movie, it was Metropolis, right? Fritz Lang 
one of the German expatriates who fled Germany in the late 30s. And we know why people were fleeing Germany at that time. A story going on over there that's even darker than the war. So, so he directs this movie called The Big Heat. And at a certain point in the movie when um, the, Lee Marvin is playing her mobster, an abuser of women, right? Just bad, uh, chronic, we call it chronic abuser of women, uh, throws a pot of coffee in her face because he believes that she's given classified information to the, the uh, law enforcement guy played by Glenn Ford. So she's scalded, terribly scalded, has to go to the hospital. And for the rest of the movie, half of her face is in bandages, just a brutal injury. But at the end of the movie, and there's several other film noirs where we see women being slapped around. And usually by the bad guy, usually by somebody who gets shot, right? But it's a little bit ambiguous. In some cases, about the attitude of the filmmakers towards the slapping around. But in this case, we know the attitude of the filmmakers, a screenplay writer at least, towards this abuse because he allows Gloria Graham's character to have her revenge at the end, and guess what her revenge is. Everybody think about it for a moment. Have you given up? Okay, you probably all guessed. She throws, flings a pot of coffee on Lee Marvin, actually on his character, and scalds him just as bad as he scalded her. So he gets his comeuppance, and she is given that power our theme is threatened women. And I'm going to read a poem. This is a poem written by a student of mine, longtime student. She took about three classes from me. Her name is Tanya Cope. I was first introduced to her as uh, somebody who was important in the Korean community in Los Angeles. And after she took about three classes with me, she went on and she got her MFA from Antioch. She now publishes, she, she publishes in Korean, in English, and has some books out, and is in good literary magazines. And this poem by Tanya Ko is one that she developed in my UCLA Extension Writers Program class called Poetry Goes to the Movies, Writing the Poem Noir. And it is called The Crying Game. One November morning outside Saratoga Springs over coffee at the Red Roof Inn, you say, we're leaving for Florida. Vivid snapshots cross my mind like race cars crashing on a track. No, my voice shakes into a laugh, shocked by my own answer. Hurricane fists, broken glass. I catch the danger in your eyes. Later, 11 minutes, we're leaving, and you slam the bathroom door. I Grab your 38 revolver from the nightstand drawer where it lies next to Gideon's Bible. Nudge the door open, shaving cream all over your face like a mugshot of Santa without the hat. In our reflection, I'm pointing the gun at the back of your head. For a moment, we're young and silly again. You think I'm pathetic. I give you a smile. I fire. One 
no more spaghetti sauce burning my skin. Two, no more black eyes. Three, no more 3 a.m. knife at my throat. Four, no more broken nose after the football game. Five, no more muffled screams. I didn't mean to shoot you five times. But the gun only had five bullets. <laughs> you know, just now, just as I was coming to the end of that poem, I remembered the woman named, I think it was Francine Hughes, Dansbury, Michigan, 19... 77, who had been abused for over 10 years, terrible abuse. And on the worst night after he attacked her and assaulted her and raped her and threatened her and burned her school books so that she couldn't go to night school, which he wanted to do, um, he fell asleep on his bed, drunk. She poured the gasoline around the bed as he lay snoring and set the bed on fire, put her children in the car, drove herself to the police, turned herself in. That was a test case in the legal system. She was not sent to jail. It was the first time in modern history where a woman who killed her husband was not sent to jail even though he wasn't attacking her at the very moment that she killed him. Since then, there's a new criteria. And if the woman can show that she's actually, that she has PTSD or has been traumatized by years of violence, um, she doesn't always have to go to jail. So, film noir. It's uh, the way I think about it, the way I teach it, the way I like to make use of it is to look at those images, look at those uh, archetypal, archetypal stories and figures and characters and think about how they overlap with what is going on right now. There's another thing that I remember. Then it's Raymond Chandler, and it's my favorite quote from Raymond Chandler. No, not my favorite, it's one of my favorite. I can't name my favorite. So he's writing in his essay about uh, why he's drawn into this area of crime fiction, right? And he describes the world of violence that film noir looks at and interprets in its own way, and detective fiction and uh, private eye stories look at and interpret in their own way. And at the end, or near the end, he says something like this. He says, it's not a very fragrant world, but it's the world we live in. And for writers with a strong mind and a certain cool sense of detachment, they can make very interesting and sometimes even amusing patterns out of all this. So, that said, good night, ladies. Good night, gentlemen. And remember, Look both ways, watch your back, and don't ever let anybody treat you like you're two for a dime.